Hey everyone, so I am here with Corey Martin and we are going to be talking about 20 more things you should be asking a future landlord before you sign a new lease for your science startup. So if anybody hasn't read the uh, five questions to ask article that you may have come here from, go ahead and take a look at those below and we'll include a link for you to uh, follow if you'd like to read the article as well. Yeah, no, that's great. All right, so uh, Corey, let's get started here. Uh, first question, and probably the biggest one, how does your landlord field the questions you're going to ask them? Yeah, so that's a really important one. Uh, I think it's really important early on as a tenant to establish a very good relationship with your landlord and develop communication channels. There will be a lot of opportunity and need throughout the process to get information from the landlord or coordinate with the landlord on you know, certain safety protocols, um, but also, you know, the chemical inventory and wastewater management and, and all that kind of stuff. We, we kind of touched on that a little bit in the article, but um, you know, the sooner you can develop those channels of communication to determine who sets the rally point or you know, who, you know, what their requirements are for emergency response and uh, evacuation. And do they require you to have uh, a, floor, a fire marshal or a floor warden or all those kinds of you know, nuanced details of, of the overall safety program. Uh, it's really important to get on the same page about that and, and know, you know, who your emergency contact is, if something goes wrong, all that kind of stuff. You just already have that line of communication open uh, that, you can, that you can leverage. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And just knowing, you know, are they kind of skirting around questions? Are they answering things indirectly? Are they really absolutely. forthright with their information? Can kind of let you know whether you need to dig in or whether you have somebody you can trust a little more. Yeah, and I think it's something too, like you can pretty quickly uh, understand whether that landlord is well versed in laboratory environments versus, uh, you know, a group that may or may not have a lot of lab experience. So, um, you know, especially in the Boston Cambridge area with all the conversions going from office space to lab space, um, you know, in the last few years, uh, there are certainly groups that are dedicated to lab space and that's kind of their core business. And then there are others that are kind of a mix of office and lab space. And, you know, they may not be as aware about, you know, the ventilation requirements and pass through air and, and all that kind of stuff just to, you know, set the standard for what the lab environment is from a safety standpoint. Mm -hmm. Great. Moving on here. Question two, uh, are they willing to let you talk with other tenants? Yeah, so this is always a good one. Uh, you know, I think, especially for multi-tenant facilities or, you know, groups that, you know, we'll be sharing control areas. And if you aren't aware of what control areas are, we discuss it in the, the, the main article. But um, if you can get information from the current tenants about, you know, about those communication channels or about, um, you know, the, the preferred vendors in the space or, um, you know, other aspects that will help you understand how likely that is to be a good relationship with the landlord, uh, you can save a lot of headaches long-term. <laughs> uh, you know, just by getting that information, knowing what the expectations are, um, you know, every landlord's slightly different in terms of what they require, uh, what they expect, and um, you know, the the sooner you can figure that out and get on the same page with them, the the more productive the relationship will be for sure. Yeah, nothing like kind of getting a potential snapshot into the future of what it would be like for you to actually be working in that space. Right, and it could be you know just really minor things like, you know, hey, the loading dock is closed from you know certain point to certain point on these days, you know, that could be a big operational challenge if, if you're expecting shipments, you know, very consistently throughout the week. Um, you know, so it's stuff like that that's not really going to come up uh, in standard communication. But if you learn that from the, the tenant, then, then that or other tenants in the building, that can be very valuable to, to how you plan and, and go forward. Uh, getting on here. Uh, number three, how many other lab spaces does the landlord own or manage? Yeah, so this is kind of going to uh, what I said about, you know, their familiarity with lab space. And um, there are definitely landlords that specialize in lab space and they have a lot of lab space um, and they know very detailed, uh, you know, requirements about ventilation and control areas and, you know, what the waste room setup should be and, and what the signage should be. And, um, you know, they're very clear about expectations because they've managed it so frequently. Um, they can also kind of advise on, you know, if you're looking to do a build out and or slightly modify the space, um, they might be able to give you some initial guidance on, you know, what types of 
uh, things would be allowed versus, you know, what types of things, um, you know, the, the facilities restricted from um, without getting, you know, too deep into the code compliance review and all that kind of stuff. So they can save you time and effort on that end as well. Um, if they're very familiar with the lab environment and, and general restrictions and, and regulations. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a very valuable point. Yeah, I think anybody who's uh, spoken with a ventilations expert or somebody in lab design can really tell you how uh, how many pitfalls there are that can really oh, yeah. cause, uh, you know, kind of um, choke points on your growth in terms of, you know, just design and just these things that are very hard to work around otherwise. Yeah, especially if you require very specialty ventilation needs, like, um, you know, some labs are much easier to air balance in terms of where the pressures are than others. If you need a clean room, if you need uh, a very clean tissue culture room that needs to be positively pressured to the other areas of the lab, um, you know, they'll be able to tell you what the likelihood of that is. And, you know, you might even request an air balancing report for the space before you get in there. So you can start to see, you know, what the uh, differentials look like and, you know, if it's a space that's going to work for you in terms of, you know, does it have the capacity to be tweaked um, if needed. Great. Uh, next up, uh, number four, are there any plans or projections for further building expansion? Yeah, so this is a, a, a big one, especially in the, the Cambridge, Kendall Square area, um, yeah. because of how at capacity most of the buildings are. So, you know, you're typically looking at anywhere from one to 2% uh, vacancy at any given time. Uh, so if you, you know, are a new company, you're looking to, you, you really want to go into to Kendall Square, um, but you want to also have some expansion potential within the building, you know, it's really important to know, you know, upfront what the likelihood of that is. You know, some buildings are just always going to be at 100% capacity and, and there's no ability to expand into other space. Mm -hmm. Whereas other facilities um, kind of have a um, system in place for interbuilding expansion, either relocation to another lab right. uh, facility within the space, you know, kind of a sequential, you know, larger unit to larger unit um, over time kind of uh, arrangement. Or you can, you know, merge with uh, other labs, you know, knock down walls kind of thing um, as other tenants in the building leave uh, and kind of get priority over those, uh, those spaces. So, you know, it, it does matter uh, to know that uh, upfront um, because, you know, the logistics and, and costs behind, you know, jumping from, from lab space to lab space and, and moving to different facilities certainly adds up. Um, and, you know, if you can stay put and expand into that space, yeah. um, it can certainly save a lot of time and effort in the long run. Yes, absolutely. And then kind of building off of that as well, uh, what are the policies, number five, uh, for subleases for other groups? So are there subleases available or able to, you know, are you able to sublease your own space out? Yeah, so this is a very popular thing at the moment, um, is to have groups take more space than they need initially with the idea of subleasing, you know, a portion of the lab space to another group, um, often a sister company or someone, uh, a, co a company that's backed by the same venture capital firm or, you know, startup group, whatever, um, and have them sit there for, you know, 12 to 18 months while they grow. And then, you know, when the primary lesser needs that space, they just say, okay, we need the space now. And then they expand into their own space that they already have under rent, um, rather than having to ask about expansion or move to a different facility. Um, they've kind of done the 50-50 thing where they secure the space, um, but they don't have to pay for the entirety of the space initially, um, which is often you know, a big uh, cost consideration, um, is getting more space than you need initially. Um, because of the square footage uh, elements, um, but then going from there. Yeah, being able to understand ahead of time, you know, what your options are for growth in the same space, uh, just moving is such a logistical nightmare and really slows you down in a lot of cases, being able to know whether you can grow more, whether that's easy or not, or whether your space is not going to facilitate that is uh, <laughs> just a good thing to know about ahead of time, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, sorry everyone, looks like we had a little bit of an internet flip there. So we'll go on to our next question, number six, uh, asking, did the group before you do their due diligence uh, before moving out, or are you about to inherit a bunch of big problems and expensive problems as well? Yeah, so this is one of those double-edged sword kind of elements where you really wanna know what the due diligence or what the move out requirements are, uh, or the expectations from the landlord uh, before you move in. 
uh, because, you know, typically the, the more you have to do for sampling and, and certification and decommissioning, um, you know, before you move out, the higher the cost. Um, the advantage, though, is if you know that that's going to be a requirement for you, it was likely a requirement for the previous tenant, mm -hmm. and you have more assurances that you're walking into clean lab space, you're not going to be dealing with mercury in the drains yeah. or, yeah. Um, you know, some contamination issues uh, that are then going to become your problem when you sign the lease and uh, occupy the space, because it's, it's going to be difficult to prove that it with someone else and not you once you're once you're in the space and working in there. Um, so that's definitely a big thing. Um, you know, some groups, some landlord groups will only require uh, surface decontamination of the spaces while others will actually require sampling and um, a certified industrial hygienist to properly decommissioning, uh, properly decommission uh, through a report uh, and sampling uh, the space just so that you turn it over um, well. There are groups that you know are very sensitive to like tissue culture room cleanliness, and right. they'll actually before moving in uh, will um, you know do their own due diligence uh, to you know use vaporized hydrogen peroxide or chlorine dioxide to basically bomb the space um, so that they know that they're working in a, in a fresh and, and clean environment. Uh, that's typically something that is required on the move out phase, but I do know that there are you know several tenants that have taken. The additional step of just doing that when they move in as well so that they know that they're starting fresh yeah especially if you're working with a sensitive cell line something like stem cells that can really be prone to uh to invasion by a uh, you know outside strain yep, absolutely. moving on to our next section here on safety and compliance uh question number seven so who in this you know new space potentially is responsible for safety equipment things like eye washes safety showers spill kits yeah, so there are some landlords that take uh, responsibility for those units, um, you know, especially in the incubator setting, it's definitely typically on the landlord. Uh, but even within larger multi-tenant buildings, you know, they might have a facilities manager that kind of operates uh, throughout the building and manages those checks and uh, spill kits and, and whatnot. Um, you know, that's very good to have. Uh, it kind of takes one of those requirements off, uh, you know, those those tenants plates. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too is, you know, if you are planning on converting, you know, something that wasn't previously lab space into existing lab space, um, often, you know, it's, it's usually like a storage area that wasn't set up for, for bench space um, or bench work, uh, you know, converting that into lab space might come with challenges related to access to an eye wash and safety shower. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that is often overlooked in that initial planning phase is how expensive it is to retrofit in the, you know, dedicated plumbing, because it has to be separate from the potable water. It's, um, you know, it's a standalone um, temperature controlled system uh, that can be very difficult to plumb in and the units themselves are not cheap either. So uh, it can greatly increase the cost of, of what would otherwise seem like a very simple retrofit of those spaces. Yeah, and hopefully, you know, everybody here is aware of just how important it is to have that eye wash safety shower on hand when you need it. Um, yeah. But hopefully you never really need to find out, right? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Ideally, we won't have to ever uh, run into that, but you know, it's one of those things where as, as soon as you need it, you need it. Mm -hmm. All right, great. number eight here. Uh, how is building security managed? Yeah, so this often comes up uh, not only for just general facility security, um, but if you are a group that is looking to have controlled substances, um, you know, the DEA permitting process definitely asks a lot of questions about building security. Um, for sensitive controlled substances. If you're considering ever adding a vivarium, that's another one that comes with um, some pretty detailed uh, requirements for building security. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if you know that you're in one of those categories, it, it makes sense to maybe pursue a building that has, you know, 24 seven onsite security or key card access or, you know, different uh, key card accessible points for different areas of the facility. Um, those are another thing that you know can be added typically by uh, the tenant, um, unless there are specific restrictions in the lease about you know against doing so. Um, but it does become costly if that's not something that's standard already in the building. 
Mm, yeah. All right. Question nine here. How do they handle fire safety and drills? Yeah, so I definitely do know of uh, landlords that will run the emergency response uh, drills on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they typically do it in conjunction with like the life safety review and the the fire system, you know, fire alarm system and all that kind of stuff, uh, the sprinkler system te tests and all that kind of stuff. Most of the time, that's on the landlord to do rather than the tenants, unless you know the tenant owns the whole building. Mm -hmm. um, but it is nice, just as a general prompt, uh, when the landlord drives uh, emergency evacuation drills as well, uh, just so that everyone's on the same page, especially if it's a, a building that has, uh, you know, it's a high rise building with uh, differential evacuation response requirements. They may have you know, a speaker system for saying, you know, this, the, the emergency is on this floor, so we're gonna evacuate the floor above, the floor below, and the floor that has the emergency. Uh, that gets pretty complicated if, you know, knowing when to evacuate, when not to evacuate. Um, you know, some landlords are certainly, you know, dump the whole building whenever there's an emergency. Others have these more high rise multi-tenant building uh, systems. And it's just nice to have the landlord uh, drive those if, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, coming up next, number 10, uh, do they have any policies or resources for tracking peroxide formers? You know, I know that you and I have talked about this many times before, just how uh, prevalent and important this uh, particular class of chemicals can be. Yeah, so peroxide formers, uh, you know, definitely become an issue over time if they're not properly managed. Um, some landlords will have specific uh, requirements for move out. Uh, during the decommissioning or decontamination process about sampling the fume hoods for peroxide formation. Hmm. Um, because that's one area, the ventilation around the, the, you know, basically the duct that leaves the fume hood, that's one area where um, those peroxide formers can deposit and start to crystallize and become a, an issue over time. And, you know, so you might need to do a peroxide test around those ducts before you leave, knowing that is important. Um, you know, there are a lot of other um, factors about peroxide former management in terms of, you know, inventory management, making sure it's properly tracked, um, properly tested. That becomes a landlord issue if, you know, the whole building needs to be shut down on a Saturday morning yeah. to <laughs> dispose of something. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those types of conversations, I think, are very important. Uh, and and I, honestly, I, I haven't seen very many landlords ask those questions up front. Uh, so, you know, if there are any landlords watching, you know, you might want to put something in the in the lease about um, peroxide former management. It's one of those things that the likelihood is very low that it's going to be an issue. But if they're not properly managed, if they're, you know, left with the cab open in the light, you know, they become a high consequence issue um, if they're not properly managed. Um, you know, it's not going to happen all the time. You know, I'm not saying that every peroxide former is going to form peroxides and become, you know, shock sensitive, but uh, the capacity is there to be, a, you know, create a bad day for a lot of people. Yeah. And also asking that question can, again, give you an idea of how that particular property manager or landlord is treating the, you know, safety and care of peroxide formers for all of the labs in that space, right? Like, right. like you mentioned, one peroxide former sort of being discovered uh, kind of being that shock sensitive state can really clear out the whole building and then cause issues farther down the line for everyone. So understanding you know, how that the ripples from that can be really useful. And it relates to other reactives as well. It's not just uh, the peroxide formers. You know, if there are things that are, are highly reactive or, you know, polymerizers or something like that, it's, it's uh, those types of categorization uh, chemicals. Um, you know, everyone should just be on the same page. It doesn't necessarily have to be an, expl an explosive categorization uh, you know, chemical to start asking questions about, about those types of materials, especially if the volumes are high. You know, right. if it's a 100 mil bottle, then it's, it's pretty low risk. But um, as you start increasing volume or, you know, if you're doing things like um, concentrating it or, um, you know, rotovapping it or that kind of thing, it can, it can you know, certainly increase the, the level of hazard pretty quickly. Yeah, and uh, going on to question 11 here. Uh, what are the landlord's policies around pouring mercury down the drains? So kind of connecting back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of inheriting the problems for the space before you, a uh, great way to sort of maybe ferret out whether or not that might be a concern. Yeah, so mercury in the drains, uh, you know, something that a lot of landlords test um, as part of the decommissioning process. Um, 
you know, I don't know that any tenant would ever, you know, put mercury down the drain knowingly, um, but there are mercury containing compounds like thimerosal. Um, there are, you know, mercury thermometers that might drop into the sink and, and break that way. Um, but I would expand this kind of to all hazardous chemicals. Mm. There are very few hazardous chemicals that are, you know, allowed to go down the drain. Um, especially, it, you know, for the MWRA um, areas, basically bleached biological material would be the only hazardous material that really should be going down the drain. Mm -hmm. uh, and even that is, you know, by the time you've diluted it to 10% or 20%, it's, it's, you know, probably not in the, the hazardous classification in terms of pH anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so really drain disposal should always be something to, to keep an eye out for, but um, especially if the landlord owns the MWRA permit, they're likely going to ask questions about chemical inventory and, you know, if you have anything that's going to be frequently going down the drain. And generally that's going to be bleached material. It might also be like, you know, neutral pH buffers or dilute acids and bases that fall into a pretty narrow uh, pH range. Um, but yeah, most of the time it's going to be pretty restricted to uh, only non-hazardous materials. Solvents for sure can't go down the drain. <laughs> Great. Uh, moving on to our third section here, uh, resources and sharing resources. So number 12, how is equipment sharing set up? Yeah, so this one I think is, is pretty important to get on the same page about, especially uh, related to equipment that's already in the space when you arrive. Um, the one that tends to come up the most in that area uh, would be fume hoods, uh, but also the safety equipment that we mentioned earlier. So typically what happens is that the landlord will certify the fume hood uh, initially, and then it's on the tenant to maintain the annual certification of fume hoods moving forward. Uh, if they supply biosafety cabinets, which happens occasionally, uh, it's likely gonna be in the same category there as far as initial certification for the landlord and then uh, the tenant takes responsibility moving forward. Um, those are all pretty common. Uh, some landlords will also have like a shared equipment space. Um, you know, they might have a demo area of the building where, you know, a partner equipment supplier um, might have some, you know, confocal microscopes or, um, you know, Kind of the, the latest and greatest piece of equipment that they want people uh, just to get their hands on and, and, and try out and, and whatnot. Um, knowing, you know, if there's a fax machine that's open for uh, shared use, you know, what is the scheduling of that? You know, how reliable is it going to be? You know, is it is it as good a perk as it sounds? Um, and, you know, would it make more sense to get your own piece of equipment or just try all the, the, the piece of equipment and then consider um, purchasing that because um, in in general, uh, shared use equipment that requires scheduling becomes uh, more of a logistical challenge than I think a lot of people realize initially in terms of you know getting on it when you need it kind of thing. Yep, absolutely. Moving on to 13 here, so end of it in a related vein. Uh, are there cores or common research available? Uh, sorry, research areas available. And what about specialty spaces like dark rooms? Yeah, so you know, dark rooms are one of those things where I don't see them nearly as much as you know typical. Mm. Uh, or I typically did a few years ago, um, yeah. and a lot of that's because you know a lot of the chemiluminescence type um, protocols have taken a lot of that, you know, you're not using a lot of radiological agents uh, to right, develop right. films. Um, you're not doing, you know, as many of those northern blot type applications. Or southern um, blots. Hey. Or southern <laughs> blots, yeah. yeah. Not, not, yeah, not to be, you know, <laughs> hemispherically biased. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, there are certainly elements that would open up those dark rooms. I don't see those typically as shared use environments anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the, the shared use environments that I'm typically seeing are things like fax machines or, um, you know, the luminescence kind of uh, plate scanner type um, elements. Uh, not so much, yeah, I, I would say not so much the, the rad type or the, um, the dark room style. Um, piece of equipment, which is good because those those often carry a lot of 
other uh, requirements in terms of photo processing and, and silver management and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, especially if fax isn't something that you're doing day in, day out, uh, having a core facility where you have technicians or folks who can really oh, yeah. show you the ropes and help you work you through everything, a uh, huge, huge difference there in terms of just how long that will take and how much troubleshooting you'll need to do. Yeah, and you know, it's not just, you know, I'm thinking about um, vivariums as well. Um, you know, there are a lot of um, cores or um, you know, groups that allow uh, scientists to come into their spaces to do that kind of work uh, that's separate from um, their general lab facility um, where they can conduct a lot of that work, you know, and it's, it's kind of those intermediate spaces between contracting it entirely out to a CRO uh, versus, you know, having your uh, laboratory employees have some say and some handling capacity uh, to generate the data um, without having to outfit your uh, facility with that kind of uh, critical need environment that you might only use, you know, once or twice a month kind of thing. Great. Moving on here. Uh, number 14. Uh, are there any preferred vendors for the building? Hmm. Yeah, so preferred vendors, I think is a really good thing to to ask landlords about, especially like pest control or um, you know, we, we mentioned the need for annual certification on fume hoods and biosafety cabinets and, and things like that. The more likely, I mean, how, how should I say this? I think it, it definitely benefits you to use uh, the groups that are already in the building so that they're already there on a consistent basis rather than having your specialty group, um, you know, pop in once a year, you know, you might have the ability to be a little bit more flexible. So if, you know, six months into the year um, off uh, kind of schedule with your normal annual certification, if you wanted to add a biosafety cabinet to your tissue culture room, you know, the chances are that that certification group might be there for another tenant uh, and can just pop in during one of their normal, um, you know, visits and not charge, you know, additional uh, travel and um, you know, site fees and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other area where this makes sense is hazardous waste management. Right. Um, sure. And that's because a lot of the waste contractors, you know, are one of your biggest needs from a loading dock capacity standpoint will be hazardous waste management. And if you can kind of jump in and have a, a group, um, you know, share that time or have you know, multiple uh, tenants coordinate um, with the same hazardous waste uh, management group, um, then they can they can help contract that out. Um, with one visit, you can share the site visits and whatnot, um, yeah. rather than having specialty visits, especially if you're one of these groups that needs frequent pickups. Um, you know, you might need weekly pickups or, or, or the like. Um, it can definitely benefit you to have a group that's already there frequently. Yeah, and another great chance to, you know, have those connections you made to your other tenants, maybe play into your favor, talk to them, see who they've liked, who they've tried, maybe not have to reinvent the wheel if there are a few vendors that may not be as reliable or, uh, you know, priced as competitively. Well, and reliability is a good one, too, because, you know, especially with hazardous waste, like, if if you're the only tenant in that region, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm saying region, but you know, even within like neighborhoods, I guess, of some of these different cities, um, you know, if it takes a long time for them to travel from their previous site to your site, you're paying for a lot of that travel time. Whereas if all they have to do is go across the street or just, you know, go to a different part of the building, um, that can certainly help. Uh, especially if you needed to do like emergency or um, short notice pickups. Um, you know, if, oftentimes this comes about um, with very small quantity generators who don't mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. main accumulation areas uh, and they're trying to ship out directly from their satellite accumulation areas. Uh, they only have three days to be able to uh, schedule that pickup you know, from when it's uh, full to when they need to get rid of it. So some of those tight turnaround time um, applications uh, can be facilitated a lot easier if the group is already in the area. Great. Moving on to number 15 here, a little more of a minor question, but still something good to consider. Uh, do they have any common space demos to learn more about new products or technologies? Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, something I'm seeing a lot with incubator spaces. And so even if you are a tenant in another area of the building, and you're not part of that incubator, sometimes uh, if the incubator is managed by the same uh, landlord as the rest of the building, mm -hmm. I've definitely seen groups be able to, you know, 
take advantage of some of the demos or the core uh, facilities in the incubator um, because they're part of the, the kind of greater building uh, population. So um, definitely something that's cool, uh, you know, science equipment is not cheap. <laughs> um, and, you know, the more you can kind of trial uh, the pieces of equipment without having to do it, you know, through your own, you know, it, it does take some coordination and logistics to, to coordinate those um, demos. And a lot of times, you know, if you're a smaller group, um, you may not have the resources ultimately, um, you know, available to purchase it outright. Um, you know, having access to some of those uh, shared use uh, areas is, is definitely an advantage. Yeah, and while, you know, you may not be having quite as many of these live demos during COVID, uh, you know, nothing really beats just talking face to face to a person where you can talk about your experiments, the limitations you're bumping up against, uh, challenges you're facing, and really get an idea of what's out there and what you can use to help your work just go a little more smoothly. Yeah, especially if you have really, really high specialty needs, like, mm -hmm. you know, a very specific wavelength on, on a microscope, or, you know, you're, you're doing something that's, you know, not quite uh, the norm for various things, mm -hmm. um, getting a sense from the technician uh, at the time of the demo, you know, what the capabilities are, or, you know, if there are opportunities to kind of influence the development, um, you know, at the, the equipment level, uh, that can certainly be an advantage for sure. Sometimes materials and disposables costs too, right? You know, you have these specialty equipments, they need certain plates, certain reagents, certain needles, right. and uh, that can really add up and, you know, maybe be able to get a machine that's a little more cost effective and that way can be a big influence. Oh yeah, operating costs on a lot of these pieces of equipment can can certainly be, you know, big dollar items. So it's not just the price of the equipment itself. Yeah. It's, if, to your point, if you need specialty you know, plates or yeah, you know, yeah. certain, even even if it's just like the film that you have to seal mm -hmm. the plate with, you know, the, all those little things can add up for sure. Yeah. So, you know, again, great to ask somebody and say, hey, you know, lay out all of the different parts that I need for this, everything that I'll need to buy regularly and how much and help get a much better idea of what that's actually going to cost you. Yep, absolutely. Great. So moving on to our final section here, uh, accommodating new experiments and equipment. So question 16, what are the details on loading dock access? You know, you mentioned this a little earlier, uh, yeah. looking at spaces in common shared areas, but uh, this is definitely a, a big one, right? Yeah. So it's going to apply to your move in. It's going to apply to equipment needs, waste management needs, uh, you know, getting that uh, chemical order uh, prompt and in, in on time. Um, move out, uh, you know, so just understanding, you know, do you need to schedule? Do you need to reserve time for the loading dock? You know, how easy is it for groups to get in and out of the loading dock? Um, you know, there are certain uh, loading docks that I know of in the Boston Cambridge area that don't accommodate certain size trucks. Right. You know, if you're using a moving company that has a certain size truck and it's going to be a pain to get into the loading dock, or if you're using, you know, uh, a waste management uh, contractor, that you know has a certain size standard truck, but it's not going to be accommodated by the loading dock. Mm -hmm. Getting a specialty size truck in there might, you know, certainly increase the the, the rate that they're going to charge for that site visit. So, um, you know, this isn't going to apply to every building, but there are certainly um, some considerations that you know I mentioned you can learn from other tenants um, to figure out. Okay, you know, do you have to reserve? Do you have to schedule? Um, what are the overall um, logistics of that and you know how often is it used right is is it something that's you know 90 percent of the time there's there's a group in the loading dock yeah. or you know is it pretty much uh, free um, at certain times of the day uh, that you can kind of take ownership of um, as your kind of standard loading dock uh, needs uh, the other thing too is uh, you mentioned kind of shared uh, vendors even like office supply vendors, like, you know, if, if the building uses WB Mason versus Granger versus, you know, those types of, you know, contractors also need loading dock access. So um, the more you can do to kind of reduce the, the total uh, loading dock need, the better. Yes, absolutely. And kind of building off that a bit, uh, number 17 here, what will it look like if you need a super heavy piece of equipment? Ah, yeah. So, I'm assuming you, you mean like an SEM or an NMR yeah, or NMR, something. Yeah, an X-ray. Really, really big. Yeah, so <laughs> often, uh, you know, it gets taken for granted that if you're on an upper floor, uh, there are certain pieces of equipment that when they're created just won't fit into standard doorways mm -hmm. or 
um, you know, certain elevators or they're too heavy to go on the freight elevator. Kind yeah. of thing. Um, in those cases, you know, you may need in, you, know, you may need a crane, you may need to take out a window to put it into those lab spaces. Mm -hmm. It's not unheard of to have that happen. And, you know, the sooner you can get the parameters of those, or, you know, if you can express the need, um, you may be able to use a, you know, only look for space on a lower floor or only look for, uh, you know, buildings that have a freight elevator with a capacity uh, high enough so that you can get the weight up to the floor that you need, uh, rather than, you know, cranes are not cheap, <laughs> yes. typically happens on weekend. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if you can avoid that based on your building selection and, and, and which landlord you're going to use, um, you know, that can go a long way toward operations and, and cost and all that kind of stuff as well. Mm. So, Rolling back a little bit to something you touched on earlier, uh, number 18, just digging into vivariums, uh, knowing what you're going to expect ahead of time, what you'll need, uh, what the limitations are. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so vivariums have very specific ventilation and uh, environment control needs that a standard lab space wouldn't. Mm. So, you know, you have to have much tighter control on temperature regulation, on humidity control, um, the ventilation is typically standalone. Um, you know, your access to that space is very uh, restricted. Um, so that, yeah, there are a lot of uh, both building uh, ventilation and, and just general uh, building layout needs. Um, and then from the regulation side, there are also, um, you know, IACUC regulations and, and making sure that you have, you know, the proper committees and, and paperwork and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. If you're in a uh, city like Cambridge, you know, there are specific permitting requirements and, and communication with uh, the public health department and all that um, to accommodate as well. And um, this is one of those things where uh, the trend recently, because of the costs, have been toward using, uh, you know, shared kind of pseudo CRO spaces where mm -hmm. uh, employees can go uh, use those uh, spaces and, and do their experiment uh, in a dedicated vivarium. Um, because the upfront costs, you know, all vivariums need to have a cage washer or disposable cages. So those need to be considered and the costs of that need to be considered. Mm -hmm. There's also an autoclave requirement. So um, those two pieces of equipment from a capital cost standpoint can really uh, be a lot upfront if you're just building out a new vivarium. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, I think the trend recently has been toward disposable cages rather than uh, investing in, in a big cage washer and all of that. But, um, you know, it really depends. And I think there are enough questions there to um, really have a conversation with the landlord about, you know, the building requirements. And if, if that's a critical need that you definitely need to have a vivarium in your space, mm -hmm. um, that should be a conversation from, you know, day one on lease negotiations and, and you know, site tours and, and whatnot, because that is a, a, a big thing that can uh, set you back if you're relying on that. Right. And also just thinking ahead, really sort of exercising some of that science imagination, thinking about what experiments will I need to do with the vivarium in the next, you know, couple of years, five years, 10 years or something. Uh, I know that sometimes vivariums can have restrictions on the types of experiments that can go on, uh, certain things about animal quality of life that may make it difficult to uh, continue. So moving on to question number 19 here, uh, what kind of work with radiation can they support, if any? You know, this is not something that everybody needs to do, but uh, different radioisotopes really do require different uh, levels of safety and um, just operational support. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely a good point. Um, there are huge differences in terms of which radioisotopes you're using in terms mm -hmm. of how easy it is to detect, what the you know half lives are, um, you know some groups will restrict it to only short life, uh, short half life materials that you know will decay over time, and you won't have to worry about widespread facility contamination being a long term issue. Um, there are other uh, you know isotopes like uh, tritium. Um, you know tritium, ha you know is very on the scale of radioisotopes, uh, one of the, the least consequential in terms of personal safety risk. Mm -hmm. um, but from a facility standpoint, 
it's very difficult to detect and it sticks around for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So if you have widespread contamination, finding that contamination can be a big challenge uh, because you can't just walk around with a Geiger counter and find it. It has to be wipe tests. It, it becomes a much more of a challenge um, from a assurance standpoint that you are, you know, clear in the, in the facility. So, um, yeah, so, you know, there are things like, um, you know, using uh, I-131 or, you know, something that has the capacity to, you know, go airborne or, um, you know, spread in, in ways that's not just like a liquid form contamination. So a lot of different things to, to, to work on to uh, discuss with the landlord in terms of comfort level. It's always going to increase your requirements for move out in terms of decommissioning and, and you know, properly certify, you know, that's going to be on the, the RAD license standpoint as well. Anytime you decommissioning, uh, decommission a RAD license, um, you have to do a lot of sampling to make sure that the space is clear and, and free of other contamination. So um, all things to consider. Um, there are a lot of CROs that specialize in, in radioactive materials um, to take that out of the lab space. Um, there are also a lot of new techniques that have, you know, been replacing, you know, with uh, fluorescent labeling and uh, those types of uh, support needs rather than going with, with radioisotopes. So it's something that, you know, is still certainly in the space. Um, it's definitely less prevalent than, you know, it would have been 10 years ago for sure. Right, certainly. Number 20, getting on to a final topic here that's maybe a little more prevalent than radioisotopes are, what about work with nanoparticles? It's a yeah, so definitely a current events topic for sure. Um, and it's one of those materials that we're still very new on from an occupational safety standpoint. So, um, you know, there aren't great uh, guidance documents on you know, certainly the decommissioning side or, you know, even the occupational exposure limit side on, you know, every single uh, nanoparticle. So, you know, there are nanoparticles that are, you know, metallic, there are nanoparticles that are biologic. Um, so, you know, it, it does um, make sense to really communicate with the landlord, you know, what you're using. Um, because if it's a biological uh, nanoparticle, it might have uh, different requirements for, cleanup or, you know, decontamination um, certification than say like a you know, metallic um, uh, buckyball type <laughs> nanoparticle, um, you know, because, you know, if you're doing nanotubes or, you know, really any, any uh, you know, that metallic side of things, it's, it's one of those things that's somewhat difficult to surveil for in real time. Um, and also, um, you know, the the requirements for how to decommission that space aren't as well uh, established as, as other, you know, more um, characterized uh, elements of safety for sure. Yeah, and, you know, like you mentioned there, uh, you know, we say nanoparticles, but that is just, as anyone knows, not a monolith, certainly. No, there's yeah, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of nuance uh, to, to what a nanoparticle is, yeah. Yeah, different sizes, different ways that they'll interact with tissues and uh, other filtering devices, just really, important to, to consider and know, you know, is your space going to support you in that, have resources, make it harder in some ways, uh, outright refuse or have issues there, uh, that could be big, big yeah. concern. Or even just have any understanding of what questions to ask or yeah. just a general awareness that it's even something to, to be concerned with. So uh, yeah, huge uh, variation. Um, I think over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna get much more clarity over um, you know, how the safety programs should respond to nanoparticles and, and what steps should be taken uh, to better account for them. Um, you know, but for now, it's really up to the academic literature to, um, you know, say, okay, these are, you know, the things that are pretty well characterized. These are, you know, the standard best practices for this material. Um, you know, let's stick with that and, and learn a little bit more because, you know, depending on how you're cleaning it up, you know, you might need HEPA filtered vacuums, and, yeah. you know, the, the range of considerations gets very broad and um, I think it's gonna continue to develop over the next few years for sure. Well, Corey, that's uh, just blitz through 20 questions there. So thank you so much for your bringing on your time here, uh, you know, helping us out, sharing all your information with everybody. Um, you know, as you can tell, uh, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about here in terms of going into a new space growing, uh, not 
you know, stumbling over these common logistical or operational things that can really slow down your research and have big impacts on the growth of your business. So if there are any questions that you have, you'd like to learn a little bit more about uh, just what goes on when you're moving into a new space, uh, safety concerns, anything, feel free to reach out to the two of us. I uh, would be happy to set up, you know, a quick one-on-one -on -one conversation, learn more about your needs and see, you know, if there's any way we can help. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think awareness is definitely step one and, and knowing which, which questions to ask and, and when they need to be asked, um, all, all very important points. Yeah, no sense in reinventing the wheel when you've already got enough concerns in a, in a growth stage, really. Sure, absolutely. Especially if you're also, you know, dealing with the logistics of a move and uh, there's so many other elements of the operations and getting, you know, things from point A to point B uh, mm -hmm. to also be worried about, um, you know, does the facility meet your needs and uh, what are the regula regulatory requirements um, related to that space or that town or that city because all those change depending on which jurisdiction you're in as well. So, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of things to unpack for sure. Great. Well, Corey, thanks again for your time and uh, looking forward to talking with you later.